morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for showing up for the first uh, Saturday morning panel. Uh, that, that shows your interest in the topic. Uh, so, you know, a couple of months back, I reached out to Raji, uh, and we were discussing, you know, uh, the potential of small satellites. If, if we see over the last decade, th there's been a paradigm shift in the uh, satellite industry, where, you know, small satellites have become mainstream. And not just microsatellites, but even nanosatellites. Like we, we've, we're hearing about 200, 300 satellite, nanosatellite constellations, and recent demonstrations with you know calls being made through nanosats. Uh, so, so there's a lot of potential there. Having, having said that, um, although we've seen a lot of nanosats come out of Europe, US, and you know other regions of the world, uh, we haven't seen so far a commercially successful mission come out of India. So. Again, one of the reasons behind this panel was understanding what are the challenges uh, that you know uh, the Indian players uh, face in particular, and the third aspect was the risks with uh, small satellite. You know, with uh, with about you know the, the number of if we see the number of constellations that have been proposed, uh, we're going the, the number of active satellites in the coming years would not double, triple, or quadruple, but would grow by as much as ten times. And, and then that's going to bring you know, an increased risk in terms of operations and regulations and other stuff. So we want to look at three primary aspects. And uh, I'll, I'll let Alicia, my co-moderator, introduce the panelists and, and the whole uh, uh, lineup of panelists here. Thank you, Sudesh. Uh, today we have with us distinguished uh, panel. Uh, both representing uh, international and national uh, small satellite uh, players. So I would like to uh, invite Julius Amrit, director of Axiom uh, Research Lab, to give us uh, his view on uh, Indian perspective. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I, I think, you know, uh, when we set up uh, our company about eight years ago as a startup, uh, at that point of time, the entire scenario in India was very different. Um, I think space itself had not reached that particular level of interest amongst uh, you know business entrepreneurs, and from a technology perspective, uh, you know various scientists and R&D people within the country. But fast forward eight years, and uh, we have now finally got uh, some resemblance of what the government really wants to do and what the government wants business in space and how it wants activities to happen. Uh, we have a huge bunch of startups right now working across different technologies. And of course, I think the large engineering companies are slowly exploring and trying to see what they will want to do in the space. So we are at a point of cusp right now, I think from regulation, from resources, from funding in the space. And uh, all of them, clearly point out to one very simple thing, which is that there is a very large and strong future for this business, uh, especially coming out of India. Uh, there are, however, all these challenges about, uh, you know, how uh, the different stakeholders within each of, within this industry are going to interact and work with each other. And it's important uh, that the startups get the support of the large engineering companies and the large engineering companies are able to probably support the startups uh, in terms of building out the commercial side of this business because at the end of the day, the, the largest customer is the government uh, in India and globally. And uh, if, we, if Indian companies decide to focus fundamentally on business coming out of India, then this whole interaction with the government and how that will happen is very critical. And that experience can come from the larger engineering companies in India. But having said that, uh, it's a global business. And uh, anything that you build out of India has to compete with anything that is available globally, uh, both in terms of uh, manufacturing, in terms of operations, in terms of applications. And uh, at a global level, the entire industry has opened up tremendously in the last five, six years in terms of accessibility of technology, resources, and money. And these three things are the pillars of trying to build a business. Um, so um, I think I'll stop here, but uh, I think fundamentally we need to understand that we are at the cusp of an industry which will see fantastic growth, fantastic applications, and it is a great time to be in this industry right now. 
Thank you so much, Julius. Um, now we have uh, Tom Sigurd. He is Director of uh, Business Development, uh, Berlin Space Technologies. Uh, he can give, share with us some European perspective on this particular aspect. Thank you, Tom. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Tom. Um, I'm one of the founders of uh, Berlin Space Technologies, uh, and Berlin Space Technologies is oh, uh, one of the um, a few uh, companies in Germany that uh, builds uh, small satellites. Um, do we do the presentation? Yeah. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna talk about is the specific challenges and uh, the, uh, the things that you can do with uh, these uh, satellites. Um, so first, uh, a few words about ourselves. Um, we are, as I said, uh, one of the very few satellite companies in Germany, and we are leveraging a 30-year tradition of building small satellites in Berlin, uh, in Germany's capital region. And we have so far um, delivered uh, uh, parts and components for up to 50 spacecraft, uh, for more than 50 spacecraft, and we also built uh, multiple satellites on our own. In fact, uh, we are also building two satellites right now. Um, the, whole, the whole thing is uh, basically we are building uh, the complete missions, we're building all the components in-house, um, and we also, that is our um, classical business at the moment, we do capacity building with, uh, with uh, new emerging space nations, right? Uh, for this, we have uh, a set of, of, of um, facilities to do all of this. There you can see the Berlin facilities. And what you will also see is that we'll have uh, labs in, in India. So what we have done, um, and I will come back later on that, is we have uh, partnered up with a local uh, company called Azista um, to basically manufacture our satellites in India. And you might ask yourself, why would we do that? And the reason is precisely cost. Um, cost and the scope uh, of the satellites are changing. As we heard earlier, uh, the satellites uh, in orbit will uh, you know, uh, increase dramatically, which means somebody has to build them. And if I look at the capabilities that we have in Berlin, that's about five satellites a year, right? And uh, the cost of such a satellite is mostly labor cost. And, uh, it is, uh, no, uh, it is a fact that the labor cost in Germany is uh, significantly higher than in India. Uh, nevertheless, the workforce in, in India is very, very skilled. Uh, and so uh, also India has a very, very good uh, launch, uh, in launcher environment with the, uh, uh, with the PSLV and GSLV rockets. So it is a very, very good place to be to build uh, these things. Uh, and so we have teamed up with Azista um, and we are having uh, in India right now uh, about 50,000 square feet of uh, manufacturing facility, uh, 150 uh, people working there, and we're working towards a capability of about 100 satellites a year production initially in order to cope with the things that come in the future. So what you, can you do with these type of, uh, of satellites? Uh, I've shown here an, an image of, uh, of our current uh, LEOS 100 uh, platform. Um, this one, this one in particular, uh, uh, shown is with a uh, sub-meter optical payload. Uh, so you might imagine this satellite being capable of doing the same stuff that the Cartosat 2 satellite is doing, right? So it has a 50 centimeter aperture telescope that's almost as large as the 60 centimeter of the Cartosat 2 se series. Um, it has a very uh, good uh, TDI sensor. Uh, it it, it is basically delivering you um, the same spec as a much larger um, uh, satellite. And so what is the advantages of that? Of course, the first thing is you can fit about 10 of these satellites on one PSLV rocket, whereas you can put one Cartosat on this rocket. So we are seeing in India a challenge of, uh, that is um, that uh, not only building the satellites fast enough, but also building the rockets fast enough to uh, cope with the demand. And if I can launch 10 satellites of the same capability with one rocket instead of using 10 rockets, that would very much easen uh, the burden. Other application for this type of satellites are thermal infrared, um, civil application might be uh, something like forest fire uh, detection. So we have in Berlin a technology that can detect fires with just one by one meter size, 
right? That it's just a few 10 uh, kilowatt of power radiated that uh, obviously uh, also is useful for early warning uh, mission. That means uh, uh, rocket uh, launches and in other uh, applications. Uh, we also have uh, hyperspectral uh, instruments, visible uh, sphere range, which help for, um, for global environmental questions. So a few words about the platform. You can see it, uh, it's there. It's uh, about the size of a, uh, of a washing machine. It has uh, quite significant uh, space for the, uh, for the payload. And the very interesting thing is that, in fact, together with our Indian partner, Azista, we built almost everything in-house. So you can look, all the blue things are of Berlin origin. They will later on also be manufactured completely here in India. And everything of green is basically of Indian descent, so to say. Right, that means uh, by the combined forces of Azista and BST, we're able to build almost everything in that satellite except the propulsion system, and we're working on that as well. Um, we have that technology right now available. Um, almost all of these subsystems have, um, have flight heritage already, and uh, we, are, um, we are moving towards uh, the capability of mass manufacturing those. Um, here, uh, a view on, on the bus. You can see it's rather compact. It's about 60 by 60 by 20 centimeter. Very, very um, thin, so to say, so that the remaining part of the satellite, because typically the size of this booth, right, is what uh, a microsatellite on a PSOV uh, rocket can be. And if you use too much of it, then there's let less space for the payload. The less you use for the bus, the more you have for the payload. One word about capacity building. Um, one of our traditional businesses has been to help emerging space nations to build their own systems, right? So we have uh, worked together with Indonesia, we have worked together with uh, Morocco, we're now uh, working together with Egypt, and we have also a program with Turkey. In this sense, we're helping uh, other nations uh, that emerge in space actors uh, to get their first foot in, in the door to uh, basically make their, their journey towards the stars. Uh, just a quick uh, um, uh, conclusion. Um, we have seen that there are about 16,000 satellites if you, you know, out there for manufacturing, if you follow all the applications at ITU. Let's say only one third of them come through. That's still 5,000 satellites. With a, lifetime, with a lifetime of five years per satellite, we need manufacturing capability only for this mega constellation uh, of about 1,000 a year. Nobody can do that at the moment. India, we have heard yesterday, needs 128 small satellites every year. If I look at the current production rate uh, in India, then I see that's only just a few in the ISRO and that's a few in the universities, but nowhere near that number. So somebody has to start building these things. At the moment, uh, there are a few initiatives in the UK with SSTL. There's some initiative uh, in, in the United States with, with uh, OneWeb and uh, with our joint venture between Azista and BST, we would like to have such a mass manufacturing capability also here in India. Thanks. Thank you, Tom, uh, for giving us the German perspective. And uh, during the Q&A, we'd like to know more about your Indian facility, the lab in India. Uh, next, we have Mr. C.D. Sridhar, uh, Director of Un Technologies, who is going to share the Indian perspective on small sats and uh, what's been happening in this space here. Good morning to everybody. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. I profusely thank the organizers. Indeed, it's a privilege. I'm from Anand Technologies. In fact, Anand Technologies has been carrying out uh, AI avionic systems to ISRO satellites for the past two decades. And now it has already embarked upon start making small satellites. Anand Technologies is building a satellite integration facility in Bengaluru wherein uh, not only small and micro satellites can be completely built, but also it will be manufactured. Today, I'll be talking about, can you please go back, starting? First slide. Yeah, next, next slide. Yeah. 
So I'll, I'll talk about just overall scenario, the challenges, opportunities, trends and cooperation opportunities, and Indian, Indian perspective. Next slide, please. So you, as you are all aware, uh, the micro satellite segment is projected to be the fastest growing segment in the small satellite market. And of course, it's useful for almost all the purposes what big satellites has been doing. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, definitely, it's going to play a vital role in mobility patterns, change from driver operator to autonomous vehicles, and uh, the market for new technology, uh, the cost, perhaps everybody is aware of that. And uh, as already earlier speakers told, more than 4,500 satellites will be sent. The small satellite market is expected to grow from US dollars. Uh, 2.22 billion to uh, 5.32 by 2021. Next. Now, this is a trend of the constellation satellites, what it's going to do. Use of TV, phone, and con uh, institutional commercial communication will change over to personal, individual, and consumer communication. The geo with high coverage will be uh, Leo with smaller coverage. Complicated and sensitive user terminals uh, going to be simple, small, and affordable user segment. Large few satellites to small many satellites. And redundancy will be in constellation as per satellite is concerned. Next slide, please. And well, this is the scenario. In fact, we have been seeing for past two days. Next slide, please. Yeah, as per the trends and opportunities are concerned, there is an increase in quality and technical performance that is what is needed of space equipment. And cooperation between national agencies and particularly private companies from different countries are opening up in the global market, so also in India. And context seems to be favorable for collaboration between companies with entrepreneurial ambition and clear growth strategy addressing global space and equipment market. Next slide, please. Well, these are the design considerations designed to cost use of cards component, simple, one branch. Perhaps this is also is very well known. And the design for manufacturability, that is another very important paradigm. Next slide, please. The, as for the technological challenges are concerned, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Optical imaging, the 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 new research, the new activities have to take place to miniaturize in terms of optical imaging, radio frequency interface, spectrum usage, optical communications on small platforms, miniaturization of propulsion systems. Perhaps this is what the uh, new companies or the startups can think of. Many of them have already started this. And the other challenges include low cost approaches to manufacturing assembly, Alternative business models such as the use of modularity and standardization, technology and systems to improve space situational awareness, networks of ground stations and uh, in-space relays, low-cost ground antennas and user terminals. As for the access to space is concerned, it's not just only the cost to launch, but also the availability of reliable launch options in the time frame of interest. And the other one, of course, is the government policies. Next slide, please. And manufacturing of small satellites, perhaps many of us, we are very much aware that terms mass production and satellite have never been used in the same sentence. Hitherto, each satellite used to be handicrafted by hundreds of engineers. It is still so as far bigger satellites are concerned. Today, satellites can be made in the same way high quality avionics equipments are made. Fewer components, lighter weight, easier to manufacture, cheaper to launch, and the satellites are designed with modularity in mind and are as well suited for multiple mission configurations. Next slide, please. Challenges. Satellite manufacturing today is a lengthy, meticulous process. In high-tech nature, the time needed to realize hardware make the progress slow for building them. Satellites would be much more agile and adaptable. With increase in constellations, increase in demand for mass producing, not only does this mean that flexible payloads, but a new way to augment satellites even after, after they are launched. Next slide, please. We have to take advantage of the, in fact, the scenario is tiny satellites are changing the space business. 
taking advantage of smartphones. Smartphones and other consumer electronics provide a wealth of ready-made technologies that can enable a CubeSat to perform many of the functions of a satellite a hundred times heavier and much larger, but substantially less cost. Next slide, please. Building satellites in the next decade. This is something very interesting. Already NASA has proved utilizing of a 3D printer in the ISS and uh, that additive manufacturing is possible in space. It will enable made in space to build satellites in orbit. The service called Stash and Deploy constructs satellites using AMF and stashed components stored on the station. 3D printing satellites in orbit means they can build without over engineering to survive the launch or with size restrictions to fit inside the payload pairing. 3D printing and robotic assembly can, only, can one day build spacecrafts that are much more complex than those of today. Next slide, please. Well, these are the constraints presently, small fairing, and the new approach will be assembly of antennas onto the single platform in space. In the result, you can see. Similarly, the stress of launch, it can be taken out, and the on-orbit manufacturing and assembly. Cost of launch, assemble updated uh, a payload after seven years also. So deploying communication satellites to enhance system performance and increase revenue return. Next slide, please. Well, I'll only mention about building small satellites on orbit would become affordable through one of two models. The first would be high volume production of identical small sites for large constellations. The second model would be for persistent platforms to build small sites as a secondary output to large spacecraft. Despite competition from their larger counterparts, on-orbit assembly would unlock considerable potential for market growth in these areas. Next slide, please. Well, these are the ground systems. Next, next slide, please. The Indian perspective, ISRO has an exciting space program. Dr. Shivadan Pillai is here. Next, he will be going to highlight all the aspects of ISRO. Qualifying ISRO uh, has, an, uh, has need to increase its uh, capacity throughput. Quali it's planning to qualify new vendors and industries, present vendors to play a bigger role in capacity building, and uh, encouraging consortiums to take up multidisciplinary activities like assembly, integration, and testing. This is the ISRO scenario. Promising startups like Astrom working on constellations, and right time, this is the right time for industries to take up development and manufacturing of specific satellite systems. We have Bellatrix here. And ATL, I'm representing ATL, we are, as I told already, is establishing a complete satellite manufacturing facility. Support needed from government to encourage industries. I'll slightly dwell upon this. Presently, there has been no satellite made in India and launched from an Indian launch vehicle. This, so far, whatever satellites are launched are only university satellites by PSLV. So the regulation need to be formed in this regard. We understand from Antrix that a private entrepreneur making a satellite, if they want to launch in PSLV, they need to pay about 18% GST. And that's quite a lot of money when it comes to uh, you know, uh, the launch cost. This is something uh, perhaps uh, we need to take up with the Indian government and to encourage, to get encouragement under the uh, Make in India uh, pers perspective. Next slide, please. The other aspects are you need to, we, let us take a look at the recent launch of Falcon Heavy. Perhaps it's a technological marvel, one of the heaviest launch vehicle. And what is interesting here is the record of cost, 1,300 US dollars per kg of payload, what it used to be around 25,000 US dollars as per space shuttle was concerned. This is very, very attractive. What are the opportunities to India? Definitely, sky is the limit here. Because innovation in space can, can, can stem from any part of the world. Our talented pool of aeronautical and aerospace engineers have the capability to attract global capital and innovation lead innovation, private sector is poised to lead efforts in innovation, including space exploration and travel. I'm sure Rahul Narayan will be talking more about it later. 
coders of IT sector is slowly getting replaced by artificial intelligence. So what's next? Space industry could very well prove to be the next revolution to energize services, manufacturing and employment in our country. Next slide, please. Well, uh, to summarize, small satellite technology advanc is advancing at a very rapid pace. Future missions are becoming more complex. Constellation swarms, advanced payloads beyond LEO, advancement in ground support, and uh, also dedicated launches. That is another very important aspect. Use of established IT and mobile technologies will definitely help a lot in this scope of satellite systems like dispensers, electric propulsion, avionics, etc., for startups, industries to take up and bring in more innovation. Growing industrial base need encouraged from government. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shida, for uh, giving such detailed insight on small satellite industry in India. Um, I would like to invite uh, Stuart Eaves, uh, chair of uh, UK Space Information Exchange Forum, to share his views on this matter. Good morning, and thank you very much indeed for the invitation to come out and participate here. Um, the title of this session talks about challenges and risks, and I'm going to uh, touch on that particular part of the agenda for this morning. Um, the forum that I belong to in the UK uh, is one where industry sits down with the UK government to uh, look at some of the challenges that we face uh, in delivering space capabilities in a reliable and resilient way. Um, and so that's what I'd like to uh, uh, talk about if we can bring up my slides, please. Um, uh, can we just go back a little bit? Hang on. We'll get there. Right. Okay. So um, the forum that I belong to has been in existence for uh, about six years now, and it's the product of uh, a recognition uh, in the UK uh, that... Uh, there were going to be major changes as a result of large constellations being put up, and there were uh, things about the space environment that was going to make that uh, non-trivial. And uh, so uh, we formed this um, uh, uh, forum to explain to the UK government that uh, space was critical international infrastructure, not just national infrastructure. If you think about systems like uh, GPS and many of the proposed constellations that we're hearing, they're not intended for use just by one particular country. They're used, intended for use worldwide. And there are some risks and hazards out there uh, that we need to make sure that those systems address. So I'm going to touch on, uh, in particular, solar activity and space debris as a couple of the risks that we face. Uh, and I'll briefly mention um, near-Earth asteroids just at the end uh, because they're um, potentially part of the problem, but also perhaps point to some of the solutions that we need. Um, one of the things you may be familiar with is uh, a major solar storm that happened back in 1859. It's known as the uh, Carrington event. Um, what I've included on the slide here is probably the uh, oldest piece of data that you'll see um, uh, during the conference. Uh, it's a plot that was actually um, generated by a magnetometer station that was in Bombay, Bombay as a, uh, in India. Um, uh, and it was the, the massive spike on this uh, um, plot shows um, the, the effects of that solar storm. Um, there were auroras seen at much lower latitudes than usual. Um, and um, at the time, the only sort of major deployed um, electrical um, systems that were affected by this solar storm were the telegraph network. Um, but the issue that we face now is we have lots of terrestrial systems and obviously all the satellites that we're putting into orbit. Um, if the sun were to generate an event like that again, um, it's possible that quite a lot of our space infrastructure could stop working or at least be interrupted in its operation um, in, uh, at, a, at a common time. Um, 
And the, one of the, the things that we're concerned about is whether this is the worst that the sun can do. Um, uh, it may not be. We don't have very good records from the year 774, but uh, in that year, according to uh, evidence from tree rings and from ice core data, there was an even larger event, possibly as large as 10 times the Carrington event, uh, that left isotopes in the Earth's atmosphere, which were then bound up in the, in the trees and the ice. And um, uh, if that sort of event happens, we could definitely be looking at uh, the failure of some of the satellites that we currently rely on. So uh, I guess the message is don't trust the sun. Um, I put up a, a slide here that I was uh, given by one of the, uh, the scientists that I know in the UK who worries about the radiation that comes off the sun. The time scale across the bottom is the Apollo era, uh, so from 1968 to 1972. The y-axis is radiation dose. The, uh, the blue lines are the dates of the Apollo missions. and. Um, the orange columns are the size of various solar flares that happened during that period. And the slightly sobering um, data that you can see there, between Apollo 16 and 17, there was a major solar flare event which got beyond the fatal level for human beings. So had the Apollo astronauts been in space at that time, uh, they would probably have died, which is the sort of thing that we obviously need to avoid. There are various proposals for um, uh, manned space hotels and missions heading out into the solar system now, um, and they're going to face that sort of level of risk. We don't understand the solar activity on short scales. We also don't fully understand it on longer time scales. Um, this is a plot of solar activity based on sunspot numbers uh, since roughly the time that the telescope was invented. You'll notice that there's a period um, from about 18, uh, sorry, 1650 to about 1720 where there were very few sunspots. Uh, the Earth got quite a lot colder um, during that period. And uh, there was a very sort of small solar maximum just before that period of inactivity. Um, we've just seen a very small solar maximum and uh, there's quite a debate in the solar science community about what's going to happen next. But if the sun does go uh, relatively quiescent, we may find that we're not talking about global warming, but global cooling uh, in the next few years. So I was very encouraged uh, earlier in the conference to hear that you have uh, a solar monitoring uh, mission concept called Aditya. Um, uh, I think that is a, an important um, sort of components of addressing the risks that we face. Um, your mission looks at going to L1, and that's definitely one of the places that we would want to be to monitor the um, magnetic orientation of the plasma that's coming off the sun, because the magnetic orientation makes a big difference to how much of the energy actually couples into uh, the Earth's magnetosphere. The other place that you might want to go is the Lagrange point number five, uh, the reason being that the sun rotates um, anti-clockwise if you look down on its north pole. So the L5 position is the place you want to be if you want to see what's rotating around on the sun heading towards us. And if we did see uh, a major sunspot complex that was liable to send energy in our direction, that would be the point uh, that would give you the uh, forewarning of a, a major event. And you could then start to take necessary precautions um, on your satellites and maybe even on the terrestrial systems that we rely on. Um, I also wanted to talk about space debris. I've included a picture here of the, uh, the first Sputnik launch. Um, uh, if you think about it, it's not a particularly great ratio. Um, one active satellite uh, and two pieces of debris. If you think it about it in uh, mass terms, it's even worse. Um, and um, one of the things that we um, did right from the very beginning was start putting up debris that we couldn't track at the time. Sputnik was tracked through its signals. The rocket body that you can see there was large enough to be visible to um, the naked eye and to telescopes. Uh, the nose cone, although we know it went up there, was never tracked effectively. And after about two weeks when Sputnik stopped transmitting, when its batteries went flat, 
um, it was just another piece of space debris as well. So um, we didn't cover ourselves in glory, and it's got a lot worse since. Um, we think there's now about 6,800 tonnes of stuff in Earth orbit, um, uh, and we are potentially going to add significantly to that with the mega constellations that are being proposed. Uh, we have uh, more than 20,000 objects that we're able to track. They are typically 10 centimetres in size. Um, there's a lot of concern about the even smaller debris that's almost certainly up there. Um, we think that if we can extend the tracking capability to one centimetre sized objects, we might find that we have a constellation, uh, a, a catalog of objects that's at least an order of magnitude greater than that, sort of 200,000 or more objects. And some really pessimistic um, predictions put the total number of objects at 750,000, which is going to keep us very busy. Um, the plot that I've got there is a plot of debris versus altitude, and there's uh, a minimum, a local minimum in that plot at around 1,200 kilometres. And when I spoke to the OneWeb system architect uh, about the choice of altitude for the OneWeb constellation, he confirmed for me that the reason they're planning to go to 1,200 kilometres is precisely because it's a minimum in the debris population. So people are now taking operational decisions about where to put their mega constellations based on the, uh, the current population of debris. Um, and I think when people start to have to make those sorts of decisions, it's really time to start trying to address the problem. One of the issues that we have is that even if we did nothing, the debris population will continue to grow as debris objects potentially collide with one another. The plots on this chart um, show various levels of pessimism about how well we do in terms of disposing of our satellites at the end of their missions. Um, the, the red and orange curves are if we do very little, um, but you'll notice that even the blue and green curves show an increase in debris just due to the stuff that's already up there. One of the other things that I would invite you to consider is that there is a, a periodic oscillation on all of those plots, and you might wonder what that oscillation is. So that oscillation has an 11-year period, and it's the effect of the sunspot cycle increasing the Earth's atmosphere and uh, um, creating greater amounts of drag, which pulls some of the debris objects out of orbit, which is why the population size goes down every 11 years. If, however, the sun goes quiescent, then we won't get that um, natural effect that will sort of limit the debris to some degree, and the curves will accelerate upwards even faster. So we need to think about debris removal um, techniques. This is very deliberately a very busy slide. What I've taken to doing is every time I hear about a new technique for debris removal, I add it to this slide and make all the pictures a little bit smaller. Um, my point here is that there are no techniques that have been proposed that appear to work for all debris objects. Um, they all look um, rather like space weapons in the wrong hands, so um, we're going to have to be very careful about how we um, attempt to do this debris removal. I think it has to be a very transparent operation. Um, and all of these techniques um, find some forms of debris difficult. Um, uh, large pieces of debris that are tumbling are very difficult to get control of um, and very difficult to manoeuvre. Um, so um, it's not a trivial problem by any means. Before we can deal with the debris, though, we've got to find it. And one of the uh, major areas that I'm trying to persuade the UK to improve um, is our ability to do space situation awareness. As I mentioned, um, the small objects, the, uh, the one centimetre sized objects, have um, about uh, the equivalent uh, kinetic energy of a hand grenade. So we need to be able to track down to that sort of size. We could end up with a very, very busy space fence. The US are planning to uh, put up a, a, a capability fairly soon that will track down to some of the objects that we need to be able to see. Um, but 
that's going to be a very busy facility if some of the predictions of the population size are accurate. Um, they could have an awful lot of things to, to track. The answer um, might lie in the infrared um, because uh, one of the things that we've seen with the, uh, the US WISE telescope, which is uh, a wide field infrared um, capability, uh, it was originally um, put in orbit as uh, an astronomical mission, but it was then used to scan around uh, the asteroid belt and actually uh, repurposed um, to try and do a survey of near-Earth objects. And uh, it turned out that it was very effective at that. And the reason for that is that um, near-Earth objects are generally quite dark objects. They don't reflect in the optical very well, um, but they do absorb sunlight and then re-emit that energy in the infrared. And because you're detecting a relatively warm object against the 3K background of space, um, WISE turned out to be very good at uh, detecting near-Earth objects. And it's entirely possible that the most effective way to pick up some of this debris that we're worried about would be to put a space-based infrared telescope. And I was encouraged to hear that there are concepts for exactly that being talked about earlier in the session. So uh, this is the census of near-Earth objects that uh, WISE has put together. There are sort of good bits and bad bits to this story. Uh, there had been various estimates made of the size of the population of large asteroids that might one day uh, come and hit the Earth. What the WISE data says is that there probably aren't quite as many as we thought. But one of the things that we do have to worry about is the fact that, based on the WISE data, especially at the small end of the spectrum, there are still very many objects to find. We've probably only discovered um, less than a quarter of the, uh, the sort of 100 to 200 sort of um, meter diameter objects that could wipe out a city. Um, and we think that it's you know, necessary to try and find objects down to that size. So we, ha we still have a way to go. Um, it's an international problem and it needs an international solution. Um, one of the things that um, has been proposed is that we could reduce the uncertainties in tracking of objects in Earth orbit in particular um, by having uh, facilities around the globe um, that could more frequently track objects so that the error ellipsoids uh, around their positions are kept small. That way we can do uh, conjunction warning much more efficiently. Um, so I'm very pleased to be at an international conference where I can talk about the fact that we need, you know, entities like the United Nations to step up and encourage people to contribute tracking data into a common system. We can't continue to rely on the US, even if they were prepared to, to do the job. They don't have sensors in enough places around the globe to actually track the objects frequently enough. So we need um, a, an international system to make it work. Um, I don't know if you've seen the uh, cartoon movie Wally, but I thought I would finish um, with this. Um, there's a scene in that movie where a rocket takes off from a very polluted future Earth and goes through um, a sort of massive cloud of debris in Earth orbit. This is the scenario that we're trying to avoid. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart, uh, for covering pretty much the whole panel, potentials, challenges, and risks. Uh, before we mm -hmm. open up uh, to the floor mm -hmm. for questions, I would like to sort of have an engaging discussion with, with the panel. And uh, Stuart, uh, thank you for letting us know that don't trust the sun. And <laughs> The reason I say that is because at the University of Colorado Boulder, I had the opportunity to work on a 3U mission, which was observing the sun in the soft X-ray region. Uh, the reason I bring up that mission is uh, because it was a student-led mission, uh, one of the first missions to be supported by uh, NASA Science Technology Mission Directory. A 3U mission, a uh, simple instrument, but resulted in a couple of journal publications, uh, was adjudged a uh, small satellite of the year at Utah Small Satellite Conference. <coughs> And again, a classic example of industry-academia uh, collaboration. Blue Canyon Technologies, uh, ADCS system, the exact ADCS system which now everybody seems to be you know, very fond of, was first demonstrated on the satellite. And the satellite was 
completely you know, built by student under professional supervision. Deployed from space station, a successful one-year mission. So you know, a lot of learnings from that mission. And, and to sort of carry on with that point, uh, I think Tom and Mr. Sridhar made very good points that in the last 10 years that we've had small satellite missions from India, we've not had a single, you know, the, the success rate has been pretty dismal. And we haven't seen any collaborations happening. So I think my, my first question, and this is to the Indian players, is what sort of has been the biggest impediment in, in doing a private mission? Has it been the, the regulatory part of it? If, if so, could you highlight which part of regulations is sort of the biggest hurdle? Or is, is it purely funding, or is it the mindset? Because to again sort of highlight the micro-satellite mindset, if, if we see ISRO came up with two buses, IMS-1, IMS-2. Both have had just one, you know, a couple of missions over the last 10 years. If you see the Myriad bus, which Kness developed it, during the same timeline, uh, about 15 years back, has had tens of missions. So is it the mindset or, or what is it that, that sort of, you know, stopping us fr from going out there? Hello? See, as per uh, the small satellite is concerned, you are aware the nano satellites which have been launched predominantly by uh, Indian launch vehicle PSLV has been for universities only. As you rightly told, so far the performance has not been all that, uh, you know, as expected and all. But when it comes to private, in fact, we have experience because we have already, we are already in talks with Antrix for launching our first small sat nano satellite which is about 15 kg class. And we find, as I mentioned in my talk, the regulations are not in place as on now, okay? Uh, perhaps it has to be evolved. In fact, uh, uh, DOS is working on that. Uh, wherein, uh, it should be much more, in fact, it should be the other way. It should be encouraging, okay? Under Made in uh, India scheme. But presently, uh, it attracts tax of about 18%. GST tax, and that's a lot of money, okay, uh, for a private entrepreneur. And when you want to compare the launch cost with somebody else, okay, that, that makes a difference, number one. Number two, as for the uh, requirement for a small satellite is concerned, predominantly the scenario as worldwide, in India also, it is uh, uh, the prerogative of ISRO, uh, because in terms of, uh, you know, meeting the national requirements, the satellites are made. Now only uh, uh, the requirements are coming up, cropping up from uh, different uh, uh, small players like starts, startups and all. So it is now uh, taking uh, initial steps and perhaps uh, we will be able to get good, uh, you know, regulatory uh, from the government uh, which will encourage and uh, uh, make this happen in a much faster and better way. If I can just add to uh, what uh, Sridhar has just said, I think uh, you know that there is a lot of patience that is required in this industry as opposed to any other uh, you know businesses. And as part of that, it is a question of not just about funds; it's also a question of about getting resources and people together to work from a far a far longer time before you actually start seeing results. So the big question for any business organization is who's, who's the customer who's writing the check and what is the service, right? So these definitions are just getting created I mean, right now in the country. So it's going to take time. Uh, it will require a lot of uh, investment and a lot of venture capital and a lot of risk to come into play. And uh, you know, people who are investing need to have the patience to wait and see how, uh, you know, resources in India, talent in India is actually able to build uh, build out their businesses for the global market. That, that's, I think, a, f a fair point there. Um, so Tom, my, my next question is to you. Um, you. You've been around for quite some time now, like almost more than a decade, yeah. and, and you want to mass produce satellites uh, from India, I guess. Correct. Uh, is it primarily just the cost, uh, firstly? A second question is, uh, are you bound by similar regulations that what Mr. Sridhar or, or Mr. Amrit were pointing out at? Or, or, or do you have a sense of what, how it's going to turn out? Um, well, obviously, once we're uh, producing here in India, we're bound to the same regulation as uh, anybody else. Uh, so uh, there's no way around it. So I'll be very soon in the same uh, boat uh, than my esteemed colleagues. Um, from 
my previous experience is, um, I would say the the work with the uh, ISO is very professional on on the on the launch uh, business side. So the colleagues from Antrix are amazing in in making uh, things happening. Um, what I have observed is that um, there seems to be a something like a quasi-monopoly uh, on, on space activities uh, in, in India uh, by uh, ISRO. And the, the question is whether in the future the ISRO should be uh, a space manufacturing, uh, uh, continue to be a space manufacturing entity or should it be, as the name suggests, a space research uh, um, thing. And so I, my, you know, as an outside observer without uh, too much feet on the ground except for the times that I'm visiting, I have the feeling that that an institution that is focused on doing the latest and the greatest um, might be, you know, having a difficult time uh, in in you know just building the same thing, right? Because I know from some of my engineers they want to do the, a new thing for every satellite, right? They don't want to do a hundred of the same. And so my suggestion is we we need to work together with them. We we can't work without them. And, and make it uh, as a win-win scenario that, that uh, ISRO can concentrate on the things that are the latest and the greatest and then, you know, the down-to-earth uh, services and, and things that just need to be multiplied, uh, that could be, uh, could be, you know, spin uh, out into, into local uh, uh, companies. I mean, this has worked in many, many other countries, had worked in the United States, has worked in, in Europe, in Germany. Um, I, I don't see any particular reason, but it, it needs, you know, also a little bit of letting go. I mean, the, the parent of uh, that is uh, ISRO for the Indian space uh, environment needs to let go and let the children, so to say, the, the companies uh, also do their thing. Great. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, my, the another topic that I want to sort of, you know, discuss about is Satellites for military, and you know, as, as Professor Chandrasekhar yesterday mentioned, uh, there's need for about 1,200 nano satellites, and I believe major part of that need arises out of uh, the military needs. And uh, so, Stuart, if you can come in and then sort of, you know, since you mentioned space weapons in wrong hands, <laughs> you, could, <laughs> well, you, you could sort of comment on that, and then uh, you know, if each of you could sort of comment on, since you've been, uh, you know, we've made efforts to sort of penetrate that space. And, and sort of try and do or propose missions to military. If you could share with us your experience in dealing with Indian military or military in general, and, and you know, how does it play around well with the civilian and the military and the mixed use, sort of the dual use of these platforms? So one of the things that is going to happen as we get mega constellations is that it's going to change the calculus for a potential aggressor who might want to um, deny capability to an, an opposition military. So if you think about the historical situation where um, a, a nation like the United States spent literally billions of dollars putting up very large, very sophisticated satellites, and the, the cost of an anti-satellite weapon to shoot down that sort of asset um, was considerably less than the cost of the satellite. So the advantage very definitely lay with the aggressor. If you think about the future scenario where you've got a very large constellation of very small satellites, the cost of the individual satellites is now potentially rather less than the cost of the weapons. So it actually changes the calculus. The uh, balance of advantage is now with the owner of the surveillance capability, with the defender rather than the aggressor. And I think that actually is um, uh, potentially a stabilizing situation. I think people will realize that um, uh, using anti-satellite weapons of the sort that have been used in the past simply isn't going to work. It's not going to deliver the military effect that they want to achieve, which is to deny um, surveillance capability. So I know, I think somebody quoted General Hyten from the US as saying that he's not planning to field any debris creating uh, anti-satellite weapons uh, in the future, um, which hopefully will serve to... Um, uh, address some of the things that we heard about in yesterday's session, um, you know, the, uh, the debris created by the Chinese anti-satellite test. Hopefully we won't see too many more incidents like that in the future. Uh, as far uh, Indian perspective is concerned, two things. Number one, 
I understand that there is going to be a major role played by micro satellites for future military demands, number one. Okay. So in fact, Antrix has already initiated to get these micro satellites produced from Indian industry. Uh, we have received some information regarding that. Number two, we at Anand, we have been also uh, receiving and we have already uh, initiated configuration of a micro satellite for uh, some of the different uh, different applications because they are all strategic in nature. They are not talked about much. Um, I have um, one, one technical comment and one, one observation. Uh, the observation is that uh, before small satellite uh, can and uh, will be used uh, by military, there needs to be a change of mind also in the, in the defense. Um, what I've uh, observed in, in Germany is that the first question that you hear as a small company or a startup um, is, you know, have you been in business for 20 years or, or 30 years? Because uh, you have to guarantee that this system will be uh, there uh, in, in the field for, for the next 20, 30 years, right? And it might take 10 years to, to, to file it. And interestingly, um, this uh, paradigm changed when the United States uh, introduced uh, the, what they called the operational response of space. And uh, I was very surprised because they were looking for a lot of things that microsatellites can do, which is rapid design and rapid manufacturing, uh, rapid launching. We have seen the uh, Agni-5 derived uh, microsatellite launch vehicle that we were talking yesterday from ISRO that uh, could work in that uh, sense of having very fast uh, launch schedules. Um, and what you get, in, in fact, is uh, what they call tactical, uh, uh, tactical operations, where basically individual um, uh, basic platoons or, or even individual fighting groups can work with the stuff. And the Americans have coined the phrase good enough capability. They say basically, if the system 80% of the time does what they want to do, uh, then that's good enough. And whether it comes from a small company or not, uh, they don't uh, really care. And that shift has enabled a lot of things. From the technical point of view, a lot of stuff is, uh, is, is possible. I mentioned uh, satellites uh, of the size of a washing machine can uh, today achieve the same thing as a Cartosat 2. Not the same as a Cartosat 3, but Cartosat 3 is also not yet built. Um, we can do with a microsatellite um, uh, hotspot detection, that means any type of uh, hot uh, thing like ship or airplane or tank on the ground, uh, military uh, early warning of, uh, of uh, rocket launches. What have the French have done is the uh, single intelligence uh, mission, the ASIME, uh, that's a, a swarm of small satellites uh, that are looking out for radio, uh, radio uh, frequencies. Um, there is uh, the concept from the Americans called uh, angels and demons, where in fact you protect or attack uh, a very large uh, space asset. The angels, obviously, the ones that fly around that spice objects and try to fend off anybody sneaking on. And the demons are the ones that, you know, if you have an electro-optical satellite, could put some ink into the optical uh, bench. I mean, these, these type of stuff, uh, even though uh, very early in experimental, are all uh, thought and um, they would not create uh, debris, would very well would uh, disable uh, the satellite. So all of these things are there. I think it's a lot less uh, technological uh, challenge uh, to do these and to, uh, to implement these, and it's more a, uh, a challenge on, on the mindset of, of, the, of the defense uh, itself, right? They are used to very large systems. Will they be willing and uh, able to work with the smaller ones? If I can just add to what Tom and Stuart said, I think uh, militarization, militarization of space is inevitable. Uh, I think uh, we have probably reached a stage where not just the cost, but the requirement of ISR uh, from space is a fundamental requirement for any kind of military operations and defense. Uh, having said that, I think the focus is a lot about saying that if commercially private players are going to enter the space uh, and you look at form factors of 6, 12U, uh, what kind of defense technology will get into those small satellites, uh, which can then be built commercially, is the key issue. The second big area that uh, I think is evolving is the fact that uh, how do you integrate space assets with uh, terrestrial and uh, marine uh, infrastructure? And that is a very, very uh, big area of work. 
the information, the control centers, ISR, so uh, C4 ISR is the Indian part of uh, this whole defense mechanism. And uh, I think this integration of how this affects the next generation of, uh, you know, uh, of defense, which is primarily going to be almost semi-autonomous, uh, high intelligence, and almost running independently, functioning independently, will require a lot of software integration also within all this, uh, uh, with the space and the land-based infrastructure. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I think so now we'll open the uh, audience for uh, questions. If you could, if you could please uh, tell your name and affiliation. Yeah. I'm Ashish Tripathi. I have this question uh, for uh, Mr. Eves uh, regarding uh, solar flares that you mentioned. Um, I, I noticed one thing that you were saying between Apollo 16 and Apollo 17 mission, there was a massive solar flare which could have been fatal had there been uh, astronauts out there. But for a good decade uh, in 90s, MIS space station was there and I, International Space Station has also been there. Uh, how come the, uh, there's not been any detection of effects to these uh, astronauts and the systems on board, which have not disrupted them, but would uh, disrupt the uh, satellites uh, more profoundly, which are you know, closer to Earth? Yeah, so the difference between the Apollo missions and the uh, space stations in Earth orbit is that the, uh, the space stations are inside the Van Allen radiation belts, which provide a degree of protection against the, uh, the worst of the effects that the sun generates. Um, they do have sort of safe haven areas inside the space stations, having recognized the potential problems. So there are um, occasional times when the astronauts are intent, you know, sent to um, one of the um, more protected areas that has more mass around. Um, but the difficulty with um, going to places like the moon or beyond to Mars is that you get well outside the protection of the Earth's magnetosphere and hence you have um, potentially a much greater dose and a much um, greater need to think about um, the radiation protection for the, for the astronauts. Um, and um, there are occasions where um, we've seen solar events and correlated um, satellite anomalies um, with those. Um, if you talk to some of the major um, satellite operators, particularly the ones that operate in GEO, um, which are, again, outside the protection of the, the Earth's um, magnetic field, um, they do see um, increased levels of upset on their spacecraft when the sun burps. Hello. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is uh, uh, what I'll be asking, or what I'll be adding to the challenges point. And uh, I'll, I'd like to bring all of your attention to a point. Actually, I'm a poor Lokande. I'm from a student satellite program, a university program, as all of you uh, somewhat uh, somehow discussed about in uh, your presentations. Uh, we are developing a nano satellite uh, which will be of uh, less than 10 kgs and it will observe the sun, it will image the sun in the extra ultraviolet region uh, for the same cause as to observe the solar flares and solar spots which are causing this uh, temperature and the mundane minimum uh, 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 causing or um, uh, phenomena. So uh, I would like to bring your attention on uh, a point or a challenge which we are facing as a university satellite program. Uh, there are two challenges uh, in major. Uh, the first one is uh, there is uh, there is a lot of uh, deficiency of manufacturing components in India. Here. Uh, like uh, many of the components which we are using in our satellite have to be imported from uh, different countries, from USA, from uh, Germany, from uh, different countries in the world, and uh, the import costs which we are uh, like paying to import all the manufacturing uh, or the, all the components is significantly higher than what we are expecting. Like uh, when we order a component of 20,000, we are paying approx 9,000 or 10,000 rupees as customs, as uh, import duties, as uh, uh, GST, IGST, CGST, SGST. So that's one of the major concern which we are facing. And the second point is uh, uh, there's a 
standardization of uh, procedures and processes or how to follow or how to manufacture a satellite, the standardization is missing. Uh, we are not having proper documentation on how to proceed, on what to do and when to do. So that's one of the challenges we are facing. We, we need uh, industries and uh, as, as you all said, we need industries and uh, the large scale manufacturers of nano satellites and small satellites to help uh, even, even uh, yourselves, uh, even the startups and also the university programs so that they can set up a procedure and uh, they should have a, a like support system of uh, like how to make, how to, how to manufacture, what, what will be the procedure. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I don't think it's a question. Anyway, I'll just comment on your comment. Okay. Uh, first of all, components problem <coughs> is there is so for everybody because minimum order quantity. Okay. So far, whatever satellite activity is going on in ISRO also, the quantity needed is not much. So that's why it's not manufactured in India. So also for many of the satellite, me even mechanical parts like materials and all. Unless otherwise you come up with good volume, uh, people will not, it is not attractive for private industries to manufacture them. Second, as per satellite procedure, uh, procedures are concerned, it is in place. Perhaps you need to interact with the right people. We are one among them. Maybe we can help you to take care of that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm afraid we're running out of time. Um, so I, I believe there are a few questions. Could we take it offline? Yeah, thank you. Uh, sort of sum it up, I, th I think regulations has been one of the major sort of hurdles. And, uh, but, but, you know, I think it's, it's high time or I think it's the right time that, you know, Indian players get out and not just target the Indian market but also the global market as, as you know, Julia said earlier pointed out. And maybe to give that jump start, uh, a collaboration with an international partner like BST, uh, a model like that could, could be the ideal way or, or you know, sort of the more plausible way to move forward. I would like to thank everybody uh, for joining this panel and sharing your views and having an engaging discussion. Thank you.